Hi everybody, welcome to this week's video on safe staffing for nurses. When I support near to registering students or newly registered nurses, they often ask about safe staffing. They want to know who decides the staffing levels and what safe staffing tools there are to make those decisions. And they also want to know what to do if they feel staffing levels are unsafe in a local area. So I'm going to cover lots of that today. I'll present some key terms linked to safe staffing, the differences between the four nations regarding legislation, um, also different staffing tools, a simple overview, and the professional staffing guidance and recommendations linked to different specialisms that recommend skill mix or nurse patient ratios, for example. There's differences between adult ICU, medical surgical wards, um, an adult acute mental health ward, or a ward for the older person, for example. I've also included some key references that will be helpful for anyone doing assignments in this area. So it should be an informative session today. I hope you enjoy it. Do give me a thumbs up if you find it helpful and do check out my other free videos on my YouTube channel. So let's look at some really important um, research in this area. So in 2012, research from the RN forecast nurse survey in England showed that staffing levels may impact on the quality of care and mortality rates. So for example, higher healthcare assistant to bed ratios increase mortality rates by 5.4% and there is a 7% decrease in likelihood of death relating to 10% increase in registered nurses. This is really important research showing um, how staffing levels may impact on mortality rates. And we now have hundreds of international research studies that have demonstrated a decreased risk of adverse patient account outcomes, including death, in hospitals that provided more registered nurses. So I've put a few here. Um, Dal Aura et al conducted a longitudinal longitudinal study on nurse staffing levels and patient outcomes. Kane et al looked at the association of registered nurse staffing levels and patient outcomes in a systematic review and meta-analysis. And Twig et al conducted a quantitative systematic review of the association between nurses' skill mix and nurse sensitive indicators in acute care outcomes. So do check those studies out. For those of you interested in research, another good um, study from Zaranko et al's 2022 longitudinal study, which linked team size and composition to patient outcomes. And they concluded on average an extra 12 hour shift by a registered nurse was associated with a reduction in the odds of a patient death of 9.6%. And they also noted that increasing the number of senior nurses had more impact on reducing mortality than increasing support support workers or agency registered nurses. So this has really important implications for future workforce planning across all fields of nursing and for future studies that are looking at, say, staffing tools, for example. They're going to all need to take into account the dilution of nursing skill mix and agency use. Some healthcare researchers who have written prolifically in this area, if you want to look at some of their studies and their work, Professor Peter Griffiths at the University of Southampton and Professor Jane Ball at the University University of Southampton. They're both health service researchers. They've written numerous papers addressing questions about healthcare workforce, consequences of varying staffing levels and skill mix, looking at determining staffing requirements. We've also got Professor Alison Leary, who is currently chair of healthcare and workforce modelling at London South Bank University. Alison's also an independent healthcare consultant and researcher, and she's written some interesting papers relating to workforce modelling. There's some fantastic webinars out there that she's done as well. And she also has a specialist interest in specialist and advanced practice. So I thought it'd be helpful to first start with some key terms because I know a lot of early career nurses and student nurses get confused with some of these terms. And if you're looking at papers on safe staffing um, and some of what I talk about later linked to professional recommendations, I'll use some of these terms. So it's helpful to know what they mean. So nurse staffing is generally talking about the size and the skill mix of your team. And it's usually expressed as care hours for each whole time equivalent nurse per patient per shift or total nursing hours over 24 hours. So if you were near to registering student, I would recommend going and talking to nurse managers and experienced um, nurses about 
um, their staffing levels and how they're set up. You've also got to think about the skill mix, the grouping together of different categories of nurses and support workers. You've got nurses, nursing assistants, you're going to have different levels of support workers as well. You have senior support workers, more junior. Um, then you've got patient and acuity and dependency tools. Acuity and dependency scores quantify the level of reliance a patient has on assisted care from a registered nurse. Um, so when you look at an acuity tool, usually they are set that um, the higher the rating, the higher the acuity of a patient um, and a high, the more dependent a patient would be on care. Um, and there's different tools out there. Nursing establishment is the total number and type of registered nurse, nursing associate, support worker roles working in an area. So another key term is caseload, and that just refers to the care of a patient or a group of patients over a given time period. And it applies to hospital caseloads and community-based caseloads. It can include family, carer support, um, and reflects usually reflects the acuity and dependency of groups of patients that you're caring for as well. If you're a district nurse, your caseload often reflect a geographical area or align to a general practice and district nurse caseloads vary in size and workload. It depends on the individual needs of the patients, the demographic profile of the population and the distribution of patients as well. And whole time equivalent is a term that's used to express nursing establishment and, and staff hours and it takes into account full-time and part-time staff. So an example would be one nurse working full-time 37.5 hours a week, for example, is classed as one whole-time equivalent staff member. A nurse working half a week on part-time hours would be, say, if it's 37.5 hour week, it'd be 18.7 hours per week, would be classed as a 0 0.5 whole-time equivalent. So they're working half a working week. So if we look at some of the national legislation on nurse staffing across the UK, in 2011, the Royal College of Nursing voted in favour of legally enforcing nurse staffing levels at their RCN conference, and the aim was to safeguard patient care. Since that vote, there's been no UK-wide government legislation for minimum nurse staffing levels or registered nurse support worker or registered nurse nursing associate ratios using any validated tools. What's happened since then, though, is that Wales became the first country in Europe to legislate nurse staffing levels. Um, they passed the Nurse Staffing Levels Wales Act 2016. All references are at the end of this talk. And NHS employers in Wales must now calculate and maintain nurse staffing levels in specified settings. So the nurse staffing level is defined as the number of nurses appropriate to provide care to patients that meets all reasonable requirements in that situation. In April 2018, the Act came into force for adult acute medical and surgical wards. And from October 2021, it's also applied to paediatric inpatient wards. The plan is to extend to more settings such as health uh, mental health inpatient wards. This talk's being done in July 2023 and things will change all the time. So you must look on government websites for, for future legislation. Nurse Staffing Levels Wales Act 2016 does not mandate minimum staffing levels as staffing ratios though. It places the obligation on a local health board or NHS trust to designate a person to calculate the number of nurse appropriate nurses appropriate to provide care to patients that meets all reasonable requirements in that situation. NHS Wales supports the use of the Welsh Levels of Care reference document and that uses a triangulated approach to guide the assignment of acuity descriptors to aid staffing um, calculations. The Welsh Level of Care document is used by nurses to um, substantiate their professional judgment about patient levels of acuity and staffing requirements. We should also note where we currently are at with legislation in Scotland. So in 2019, the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act was passed and the provision for this act comes into force next April in 2024. So watch this space. Um, the act says um, basically places for healthcare settings, the act places a duty 
on health boards to ensure appropriate staffing. For care settings, the app places a duty on those who provide care services to ensure appropriate staffing. So this act is the first in the UK to set out safe staffing requirements across health and social care services too. So we're still waiting for the act to um, be implemented from next April following consultations and England and Northern Ireland may follow. And we've also got a whole remit of safe staffing tools, models and approaches to work out staffing requirements alongside any future legislation. We've got professional guidance on staffing and I'm going to give you a bit of an overview on that too. So if we look outside the UK, we know that some countries or regions in countries have set minimum mandatory nurse patient ratios, such as the US California, where the ratio is one registered nurse to five patients on a medical surgical ward, one registered nurse to six patients on a mental health inpatient, one registered to four patients on a paediatric ward. In Australia, New South, New South Wales in Australia, one registered nurse to four patients on a medical surgical ward, which is even better than the US uh, ratios there. Um, one registered nurse to four patients on palliative care wards and one registered nurse to four patients on mental health inpatient wards. In Victoria, Australia, one registered nurse to four patients in acute, general and medical surgical wards. So in the UK, we do have some UK professional recommendations and standards for nursing establishment, skill mix, nurse to patient ratios from some professional bodies, which I'm going to present a few examples in this talk later. But in the UK, hospital wards, the general consensus is that nurse to patient ratio should be one registered nurse to eight patients, which you can see is not as good as the one RN to five patients in California, for example. However, some patients may need one to one for a whole shift or you may have eight patients who are awaiting discharge who are classed as low dependency less acute. So there has to be some professional judgment made by a nurse to determine the correct staffing requirements on a hospital ward. Recently, we've seen nursing unions supporting strikes for nursing pay, but I would throw out there, do we also need to be focusing on better nurse to patient ratios that reflect the challenging environments nurses are working in and that reflect the previous research that I just presented. As we know, more registered nurses equals lower mortality rates and less adverse events. And this might be something you want to discuss in your assignments or with your tutors. The general argument against setting staffing ratios, um, you'll see it debated in literature, is that patients have different acuities and dependencies, as I just mentioned. You may have somebody that needs one to one, for example, versus 10 self low dependency patients. Um, as I've already mentioned, but I do think the standard one registered nurse to eight patients in the UK is not enough with extra demands that we have across our services today. So to retain our current workforce, we need to look at those numbers of um, registered nurse to patient ratios. We've got an increasing number of learners um, to support in our clinical settings, we've got future apprenticeships. And um, so do our nurse patient ratios need to change in line with some of these um, the minimum mandatory nurse patient ratios um, that I've just presented. So having talked about um, some minimum staffing levels across other countries and the legal aspects linked to our UK nation, looking at professional staffing recommendations. So we have some key bodies, uh, professional bodies across the UK in different specialisms and fields that have recommended staffing levels and skill mix ratios. The Royal College of Nursing offers guidance to employers. Queen's Nursing Institute offers recommendations for minimum registered nurse visit ratios in the community setting. Um, we have professional bodies that also recommend the additional use of acuity, dependency tools, different workforce planning tools um, to establish those optimum staffing levels. A triangulated approach is recommended that enables employers to establish what constitutes safe, unsafe or at risk staffing across areas. So I'm only going to present a few of these recommendations. Do look up. Is there any link to where you work, your field or your specialism? So I'm going to present some 
professional recommendations and guidance from um, different professional bodies. I'm going to start with the Queen's Nursing Institute in 2022, and they published workforce standards for the district nursing service that are very helpful. Just note that I've taken extracts from these standards. You do need to go and look at the full standards, but they're really interesting to look at. Um, so in this standard, a registered nurse visit should be a minimum of 30 minutes to allow to, for the entire nursing process to be enacted. The minimum visit ratio should be one registered nurse visit for the initial assessment and then at least every fourth visit to apply the nursing process in full and initiate any changes, assess new needs or evaluate care. Interestingly, um, the standard describes what a district nursing team should comprise. It should comprise 60% of experienced registered nurses, 20% newly registered nurses, and 20% nursing support workers, and that includes healthcare assistants and nursing associates. It also states a caseload of over 150 per whole time equivalent is deemed a tipping point where when district nurses and community um, staff nurses work in teams. So as I mentioned earlier about the definition of a caseload, that's very helpful to think about when it's getting too much and when that tipping point is. It also states 10 visits a day is associated with the tipping point for people deferring work. So this is an important document for district nurses and community teams as it's setting an actual point at which you say no. Um, and there's evidence to say, you know, that this is, well not no, but this is too much and we need to do something about it. Um, and uh, and um, to have those discussions in teams. So some more current standards from the British Association of Critical Care Nurses. As I said, you need to look on these websites. There's a quality, the Queen's Nursing Institute website will have the details. You can check the standards and download the standards. Um, and the same because they can be evolving and changing. Um, but current standards are you will find on this website. So for adult intensive care, they suggest um, they recommend one registered nurse to one ventilated patient, each ICU patient to have access to one registered nurse with a post registration qualification, um, one supernumerary senior critical care qualified to units of six beds or more. Registered nurse patient ratio on adult ICU should not fall below one registered nurse to two patients. And every patient in a critical care unit must have immediate access um, to a registered nurse with a post registration qualification in this specific specialty. So do check those out on the website. If we look at some nice guideline, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in 2014, have a look at the current standards on the NICE website. They stated no single staff patient ratio can be applied across all adult inpatient wards, which is what I mentioned earlier. If registered nurses caring for more than eight patients during a day shift, you should closely monitor for evidence of increased harm and nursing red flag events. And that's where that one in eight, one registered nurse to eight patient ratio came from and where I sort of suggested we need to maybe revisit that. So in acute mental health ward, we have standards set by the NHS England and Royal College of Psychiatrists websites, um, and they'll be updated. Um, so what is um, expected is a ward of 15 acute patients would be unsafe with fewer than three registered nurses per shift during the day and two registered nurses at night. Should be noted that higher staffing levels though might be essential if a patient is acutely ill or requiring one-to-one -one care. The service should be staffed by permanent staff members and bank and agency staff members should only be used in exceptional circumstances. Um, the use of health staffing framework for support is recommended that is not prescriptive and it currently recommends two workforce calculator tool tests. And as I said, these can be evolving, but they're just giving you an example that we have these professional standards and recommendations. They're not legalized, they're not set down in, uh, in, a, in a legal framework, but they are strongly recommended by these professional bodies. When we look at nursing workforce planning methods and approaches, there's a number of different tools that can be used and approaches. And a good paper to look at, um, looking historically, Hearst 2003, 
um, his classification of her classification of approaches is widely used as a reference point through the UK. So we've got the professional judgment approach that originated from Telford that uses an expert group, say, for example, clinical workforce or finance to estimate the um, size and the skill mix of each ward team. There's the nurses per occupied bed method, also known as top down method, uses average numbers and ratios of nurses per occupied beds to determine staffing establishments. The time tasked activity approach that focuses on the type and frequency of nursing interventions required by patients to guide staffing. So you get values, minutes attached to each, each nursing intervention and the amount of time to care for one patient over a 24 hour period is determined. Regression based systems predict required number of nurses for a given level of activity. So that's useful when predictions are possible, such as the number of planned admissions, for example. Acuity quality methods estimate and evaluate the size, the mix of a ward or nursing team using dependency activity quality or acuity quality methods. Um, there is no evidence to support the choice of particular nursing staffing tools, and Griffiths wrote an interesting paper about this. Um, the authors went on to suggest that future research needs to evaluate the impact of existing tools. We're all very good in nursing, we're launching new tools, but actually we need to evaluate what we've got potentially to inform going forward. Um, and as I said earlier, the references for um, Griffiths et al um, are on a later slide if you're needing it for an assignment. So we've looked at legislation, some professional recommendations and standards, um, but we also have workforce planning tools to look at the um, to determine nursing establishments. And there is a variety across the four nations that and different approaches that are used. So in Northern Ireland, um, they use nationally determined ranges, not ratios of staff to beds. And they promote the use of these normative ranges using this framework. Um, so it's really interesting to look at that framework. And but they also um, promote a triangulated approach using the Telford model of professional judgment to determine those nursing establishments. In English hospitals, the safer nursing care tool is promoted from the Shelford Group 2013. References are at the end of this talk. Um, and that safer nursing care tool is also endorsed by the National Institute of Health and Care Research. And again, it should be noted that England and Wales use a triangulated approach to nurse staffing, which includes these workforce measurement tools, nurse sensitive quality indicators and professional judgment. We also have the care hours per day per patient day CHPPD measure that's recommended by the Department of Health. Um, as a consistent way to record nurse staffing required over 24 hour periods in English in in patient adult hospital wards. Um, and as I said earlier, Scotland have got a range of field specific nursing midwifery and workforce planning tools for use um, under the common staffing method. They're built, um, the common staffing method is built around ensuring that staff use a systematic approach. I should also remember that we've mentioned that we've got some field specific tools. So in children, we've got the Great Ormond Street Hospital Paediatric Acuity and Nursing Dependency Assessment Tool. Um, and that's an established national software tool developed to measure paediatric acuity dependency, leading to a calculation of nursing requirements. So you'll see some online specific field specific tools, um, and that can be accessed through the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children NHS Foundation Trust website. It's important to note how nurse staffing levels are monitored by different inspectorates across the four nations. So in England, we've got the Care Quality Commission um, and inspectors examine whether an employer has got sufficient number of skilled nursing staff to deliver care. The equivalent body in Scotland is Health Improvement Scotland, in Wales, Healthcare Inspectorate Wales, Northern Ireland, Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority. And senior nurses are aiming to maintain their nursing numbers and skill mix according to predetermined levels agreed by their employers. And staffing numbers and skill mix ratios should never be viewed in isolation. Staffing tools should always be triangulated with patient acuity, dependency scores, professional judgment to establish an accurate picture of nursing workforce demands. 
So going forward in the future, if you want to request assistance with staffing or want to close beds, nursing staff are able to request assistance and help with their staffing levels at any time. To maintain standards of patient care, we need to escalate if there's issues, if there's a risk um, of standards falling to at risk or unsafe levels. Many hospital and community settings have daily bed meetings, caseload reviews to enable them to keep up to date with services. Um, and if you've got an opportunity to attend those meetings while you're a student or an early career nurse, do try to observe the tools they're using, how they're making those professional judgments, how they're authorising bed closures or moving staff across different areas. Senior nurses also usually provide evidence of safe nursing indicators not being met. They have to do that prior to bed closures or to book staff outside staffing budget. So you need to look at these safe nursing indicators and that might include safety outcome measures like um, things like increasing um, inpatient or family complaints, patient falls, hospital or institution acquired pressure ulcers, any adverse events or mortality rates. Um, are you getting to do your observations? Is there care being missed? Staff report measures may include increasing percentage of missed breaks, percentage of breaks not taken over time, extra hours work or a high reliance on agency staff, a lack of compliance with e-learning, for example, staff not doing, been able to do their e-learning. So what do you do if you've got staffing concerns? It's important to escalate concerns to the nurse in charge or bed manager. Who should support and review the situation? They should re reconfigure shifts, for example. Can staff on an office day or an education day come and support? Can they move staff around? Can they rejig rosters so late staff might be able to come in early and go home a bit earlier? Um, and when escalating, you should try and evidence the impact of the staffing deficit on patient care. How many staff have you got? The skill mix. The first thing they're going to ask you is how many registered nurses? How many support workers have you got? Um, you adhere to local escalation policy policy and you formally request additional support. Um, report any safe nursing indicators, detail anything on an incident report that's required, um, staff not having breaks, patient falls, adverse events, missed observations should be recorded on incident forms. Always record data and the time the person you spoke to to escalate that there wasn't enough staff that you feel that there needs to be more staff in case there are any complaints later as well. If it continues, you've got safeguarding concerns, carry up on that escalation pathway. Do you go to a matron? Whoever is next in line to go up that escalation pathway, so you've done as much as possible to escalate. We have freedom to speak up, guardians. If this is consistently happening, you will have union representatives potentially that you can talk to. And, you know, the last resort would be going to the CQC. But ideally, if you go up the um, escalation pathway, um, you should find that you get that additional support. So I hope you found that um, overview helpful. I've got lots of other videos. Here's some here um, that you might want to look at a range of um, topics linked to support and career development for nurses. I know that many of you will want references so you can stop the video at any time and I'll put these references up if you've got assignments. I cannot put the web links on on YouTube, but you will find them on these um, relevant websites. And I hope you found the talk helpful today and my contact details are here if you want to DM me on Twitter. Do put any questions or comments in the YouTube comments and give me a thumbs up if you found this helpful today. Um, if you'd rather DM me privately to ask me a question, I'm very happy to answer questions and I hope you found today helpful.